starts. <laughs> but you know what? It was worth it. Yeah, it was worth it. Ah, I love traveling, man. I love traveling and learning about places, reading things, meeting new people. I, uh, when I think about, like, the history of racism, I'm, I'm fascinated by racism as a concept, as, you know, as an action, policy, all of, all of it fascinates me. I read, I read these stories in history. And one of the most fascinating things I read about recently, one of the most fascinating places, was a place called Rochester, New York, <laughs> where, genuinely, this blew my mind, where they had a city which was basically dedicated to rehabilitating people who had escaped slavery, right? So black people who had escaped the South, got into the North, were rehabilitated at this place. Uh, Frederick Douglass wrote many of his works there. The suffragette movement kicked off there. It's a powerful, powerful little place. And like I was reading these stories, and what they would do is, slaves would escape from the South. They'd make their way to the North. They would get to Rochester. The Underground Railroad would get them there. And then they would rehabilitate them, put them on boats, and send them to Canada so that they could live free. And I was like, that's like, it's a fascinating story for two reasons. One, it reminds you that there were a lot of good people, white people out there, because a lot of time I get angry at white people, and then I'm like, no, no, there's good ones, calm down. <laughs> um, and the second part of it that was amazing was that they convinced black people to get back on boats. I think <laughs> that's one of the most amazing stories I've ever read. Because like, do you know how convincing you'd have to be to convince someone who's just, like they've just escaped slavery. Think about that for a second. Somebody's just escaped slavery. They've made their way there, finally. All right? They wake up after one night of free sleep. And they walk out and it's just like, hey man, I just want to say thank you so much for everything you did for me, man. Well, you know what, my friend? Nobody deserves to live the way you lived and I'm, I'm glad we got you out. Thank you so much. I appreciate you, brother. Thank you, my friend. Okay, all we got to do now is get you some paperwork, get you cleaned up, and uh, put you on a boat, get you to Canada, and you can live a free life and everything's going to be better. Uh, I'm sorry, hold up, hold up. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, go, go, yeah, we, could you come again? You, what did you say? Oh, I know, the paperwork thing is weird, but we got to get you some, some, some identification. No, 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 you said something about a boat? Yeah, we're going to get you on a boat so you can get to Canada. Yeah, yeah, nah, I don't, I don't, yeah, we don't do boats no more. I don't, even, I don't know if you know our history, uh, but me and my people, we took a cruise one time. That shit didn't go so well. So, yeah, we, we got to find another way to get to Canada, if you don't mind. Now, but the boat is the best way for us to get there from Rochester. Yeah, that might be the best way for y'all. But we gonna walk. Uh, hell, we can run. We can run real good. We can run, but we ain't getting on no boat. My, my friend, you, you gotta get on the boat. Man, I ain't gotta do shit. I just got free. Imagine if I get on that boat and on the other side, I'm in the same place. What they gonna say to me? Why'd you get on that boat? Cause he was real nice. Oh, hell no. I ain't getting on no boat. Well, but you gotta, you gotta get on the boat though. You, you gotta get, you're free now. You gotta, you gotta get over this. Look, man, maybe one day in a few hundred years, one of my descendants named Kanye West will be over this shit, but I ain't over it right now. So I ain't getting on no boat. Got, we gotta get you on the boat, damn it! I'm not getting on no boat! And that was the day the phrase nigger please was invented. <laughs> A white man turned and he's like, nigger please, I need you on that boat! <laughs> and that story was passed down generation to generation. Black person to black person, free man to free man. So then that white man got down on his knees and he said, nigga, please. Nigga, please, nigga, please. I ain't never heard that phrase before in my life. Nigga, please, nigga, please, nigga, please. I know, I know that's probably a phrase Barack Obama used at least once in the White House. At least once. Like, Mr. President, do you, do you think Trump is, is because of you? Do you think you caused this? Uh, nigga, please. Just one time, one time I know he used it. I have those landline moments in my life where I wish I had an old school phone so I could slam it down. Young people will never know the joy of slamming a phone at the end of a call. Like cell phones have robbed us of that. That feeling, you know, where you get to tell the person, screw you, bah, ah, it feels so good. They feel it on the other end, like, ah. It's like you punch them in the ear. Now with phones, you've robbed of all of that. You know, there's no sense of power. Screw you! Eh. It's all you have. And you can't even press the screen hard because you're scared you're going to crack your own phone. You don't... Eh. I hate cell phones so much. I think they're robbing us of our intelligence. I, I honestly believe cell phones are going to be the reason that human beings devolve. We're going back to the Stone Ages because of those things. Everything about them is turning us into apes again. Neanderthals, 
was looking at my thumbs the other day. I spent so much time texting and sending messages that I feel like they've started curling over like monkey's hands. I've gotten really good at typing and grabbing branches. Everything about those phones is robbing us of our humanity. We were proud because we evolved, we stand, we walk tall. And then we got our phones. And now every day we spend like this. And over time we're gonna go back. Down. Have you tried to have a conversation with someone on their phone? It literally sounds like a caveman. <laughs> We've lost it. We don't know how to communicate anymore. Now we use those, those emojis for everything. Emoji, 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 emoji. No, no one even uses words. Send a paragraph to your friend. Had a great day, did this. It was so funny. They reply, hey. <laughs> And did you hear? She died. Ooh. That's it? No words? Emojis are basically the cave drawings of 2015. Yeah, we judge cavemen. We think they were primitive because we couldn't find any words in their pictures. Someone's going to think the same thing of us. The way we look at cavemen and go, oh, look at them, they couldn't write. Oh, the caveman, he was so simple. Oh, and he was hunting and he had a family. Oh, simple. Someone's going to see our messages in a thousand years. Be like, oh, look at that. Oh, the people of 2015, simple. Oh, yeah, look at that. Oh, they laughed and they cried. Mm. Sometimes they laughed until they cried. Yeah. Some of them were blind in one eye. Yeah, but that didn't stop them from having fun. Oh, and there were monkeys that didn't talk, oh, monkeys that didn't listen, oh, and they were always dancing in red dresses, oh, 2015, a simple time. We don't communicate anymore. Got our emojis, phones are making us dumb. I fear most for women, you know, the most intelligent of our species. And I fear for you, I fear ladies. I fear for what the selfie has done to you. <laughs> women are obsessed with selfies. The average woman spends 50% of her day thinking about when she can take the next selfie. That's all she's thinking about. Oh, let's take a selfie. Oh, let's take a selfie. Let's take a selfie now. Let's take a selfie. Take a selfie of me, take a selfie of you. Oh, this is great. Selfieception. I love it. Everyone's just in there. Selfie, 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 selfie. And you know what's fine? The pictures look great. The pictures look great. Instagram. Oh, like my picture. Like my. Yeah, it looks normal. But have you seen what it looks like when someone makes a selfie? It is the creepiest thing you've ever seen in your life. A normal woman sitting by herself, having lunch, doing whatever she's doing. And all of a sudden, she'll look at her phone and something in her head goes weird and she transforms into a selfie monster. She literally just be there looking at her phone, going through stuff and all of a sudden she's like... Just randomly took a picture, <laughs> caught off guard, <laughs> hashtag I woke up like this, <laughs> hashtag no you didn't, hashtag you crazy, hashtag stop that shit. I'm glad to be here man, this was my dream, my dream was to come to America, you know, not, not for a job or money or anything, I've got a great life back home, I always came here because I wanted one thing and that is I always wanted to be black. Um, I grew up in South Africa during a time known as apartheid. And for those who don't know, apartheid was a law in the country that made it illegal for black and white people to mix. Uh, which was awkward for me because I grew up in a mixed family. Uh, well, with me being the mixed one in the family. Uh, my mother's a black woman, South African, and my father's Swiss, from Switzerland. Uh, so he was a white man. And ba well, he still is. It's not like he changed. I, uh, I say that like through hard work and determination, he became black. No. That, that did not happen, and sir, you're fine. I see the white guy going, is that part? No, it's not possible. You are fine, sir. He's still very white, very white. And so they got together, my parents, black mom, white dad, which was against the law, but they didn't care. They were mavericks, you know? Yeah, my mom was like, woo, I don't care. I want a white man, woo. And my dad was also, well, you know how the Swiss love chocolate, you know? So he was just, he was in there. 
so they got together and they had me, which was illegal. So I was born a crime, um, which is something they never thought through. Because as a family, we didn't live together normally. Like in the streets, my father had to walk on the other side of the road. And he could just wave at me from far, like a creepy pedophile. So. <laughs> My mom could walk with me, but if the police showed up, she had to let go and act like I wasn't hers. Every time, be like, woo! Like, it's not mine, it's not mine. It felt like a bag of weed. And one, one fateful day, uh, you know, because I was never given a race, I was never called black, never called white, I, I had the privilege of meeting an American, and he said to me, he said, well, you know, Trevor, it's funny you say that, because if you come out to America, they'll label you as black. I said, really? He said, hell yeah. Everybody's black out there. And I was like, well, I want to be black. Yeah. I bought myself a plane ticket because I found out it's true. Mixed race people are categorized as black in America. Yeah. The only catch is you have to be successful first. Before that, they call you mixed, achieve success, and you get upgraded to black. All the famous mixed people have done it. Singers like Alicia Keys and Mariah Carey, mixed, but they say black, right? Tiger Woods, mixed, but they say black golfer. The most famous mixed person on the planet, Barack Obama, mixed, half and half, but you say your first black president. When he was running, he was the mixed candidate. <laughs> now it seems obvious. People are like, yeah, he won. Back then, nobody believed he would win. I remember comedians dissing him. They'd come up and be like, how many of y'all seen that mixed race fool run of a president? Y'all seen that crazy ass mixed fool? How some mixed fool gonna come in? Even a black man can't win. This mixed fool thing gonna win. He gonna win. I see no mixed fool coming out of here winning the United States, that mixed fool, that mixed fool. And then he won, and all of a sudden they were like, my <laughs> So I see. And I wanted black. So I bought myself a plane ticket. Yeah, 18 hours of flying, that's what I had to sit through. 18 hours of non-stop flying. I didn't sleep a wink. I sat on that plane and I watched every single black American movie and TV show I could find just so I could practice being black. I was not going to mess up that black opportunity. I just sat there like a madman in my chair, just like watching movies, practicing. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you laugh, but I landed. I landed in Miami and I was fluent in my black American for shizzle my nizzle. I was just, yeah. I was so black. I was even laughing black. I was like, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, my man. I was super black. Till some guy came up to me and was like, Oh, yeah, papi. Yeah, yeah, come on, eh? 18 hours of flying and I still wasn't black. I was Puerto Rican. Some of you may or may not know, I got a job. This is fantastic for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, yeah. Um, that's, uh, and that's, that's how my grandmother put it, funny enough. I phoned my grandmother to tell her that I'd be working on The Daily Show, and she was really excited. She was like, ooh, Trevor, I'm so happy for you. Well done, you got a job. I said, no, no, Granny, I already had a job. And she's like, no, you didn't. <laughs> Did you have an office? I said, no. She's like, then it wasn't a job. <laughs> That's all she cares about. My mom was a bit better. I called her to tell her the news. Uh, and to give you a bit of a backstory, I've got two younger brothers. Right? So one brother is nine years younger than me, and then the youngest is 20 years younger than me. Right? And so the youngest uh, just became... Uh, one of the student council members in his school, right? So he got onto the student council. So I phoned my mom to tell her my good news. I'm on the phone with her. I'm like, oh, mom, I don't know if you heard. I'm going to be on the Daily Show. And she's like, oh, my baby, I'm so excited. Oh, praise Jesus. This is wonderful. Well done, baby. I'm so happy for you. And did you hear what happened to your brother? I'm like, no, what happened? She's like, oh, he's on the student council at his school. Oh, I'm so excited. Both my boys are doing big things in the world. I'm so happy. like, yeah, some things are bigger than others. <laughs> She's like, no, it's all the same. I was like, you say that, but I mean, you know. Come on, you know. <laughs> She's like, okay, fine, fine. You were never student council, so let's cheer for you. You're like, what?
No immigrants, no spice. And definitely no tacos. And I know my friend Dave would never allow that. I've never seen him so passionate. He got up, he gave me a speech about tacos like he was the heir to a taco dynasty. He finally turned to me, he's like, Trevor, is your friend and is an American? I'm gonna make sure that you get tacos. It was the last thing I ever do. I was like, why don't we just go now, Dave? He's like, that'll work. You know my favorite part of any conversation is? Is when people think you're gonna argue with them, but you agree, and they've already chosen anger. <laughs> because nobody, nobody just changes their tone. Everyone has to stick in the anger for a while because they think it makes them seem less crazy. Like, it happens in relationships all the time. You'll have a fight that's not a fight. You know, just be like, God damn it, Karen, every time I ask for your support, you're not there for me and it hurts me sometimes. You know what, Bob, I'm sorry. No, don't try and thank you very much. I didn't think you would apologize, and so I chose this tone, and now I feel like an idiot. I'm gonna leave the room and reset. Cause I wasn't gonna fight, I wanna have tacos. Let's go get tacos, Dave. And so we rolled together, jumped into the car, and so we drove for about 20 minutes right, to what I thought was going to be a restaurant. Instead, Dave pulls over into an abandoned parking lot. Kills the engine, looks over at me and goes, all right, dude, we're here. I was like, where, at my murder scene? I was like, no, dude, we're getting tacos over there. And he points, and in the corner of the parking lot was a truck, all right? a food truck, yeah, which I've now learned is quite common in America. In fact, some of the best food you'll find at a food truck. But at that moment in time, you have to forgive me, I was a little bit apprehensive, okay? Yeah, I just wasn't quite comfortable with the idea of getting my food from an establishment that would not be there the next day. I feel like there's a certain level of accountability that comes with permanence. Dave was adamant though. He's like, dude, you gotta get it from a truck, dude. That's how you know it's real. I was like, all right, well, let's, let's just get this over with. Let's do it. So I hop out of the car, walk up to the truck. And it was definitely a taco truck because there's a sign above it flashing that read tacos. <laughs> tacos. <laughs> tacos. <laughs> and by the way, we weird piece of trivia about me as a person. I hate signs that flash but don't change. Yeah, I always feel like a sign shouldn't be allowed to flash unless it intermittently changes to some other information. Otherwise, I think that's wasted suspense. It should be illegal. Because <laughs> it always catches my eye, and then I wait for something else, like tacos and tacos. And what else? Tacos. Anything else? Tacos. Just stay on tacos. <laughs> anyway, now I'm irritated. I walk up to the truck, and as I get there, this little dude pops out. And he was in <laughs> a completely different mood to me. You could tell. He just popped his head. I was like, hey, how you doing, man? You want some tacos? I said, ah, oh, it would be awkward if we didn't. <laughs> He says, what? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, man, of course. But you never know. Maybe you want something else, yeah? I said, oh, uh, what else do you have, my friend? He said, no, nothing, man. It's a taco truck. <laughs> I said, oh, thank you. Thank you. That's a moment of my life I'll never get back. Thank you very much. He said, no, no, no. Calmate, man. I'm just staying. You know, I don't want to waste your time. You want tacos? Let's do tacos. How many tacos do you want, my friend? I said, well, I don't know how many tacos to get, sir. I've, I've never had tacos before. So you've never had tacos? <laughs> I said, no, I have. You've never had tacos? I was like, oh, you should meet my friend Dave. Because like, I'm not going to order food when I don't know what it is, okay? I don't know what the quantities are. I don't know what tacos are. I don't know what taco is. I don't know what taco be, okay? What do you say? How many do you get? Because just now I'm going to be like, give me five. What if tacos are like little pigs or something? And I'm like, give me five. Next thing I'm walking home with this, wee, wee, wee. And that's how I started my farm. Like, I have no clue what these things are. So I'm like, yo, man. I just want to try the food. Just give me enough to try. He's like, okay, you just drank it out. Two tacos is enough, my friend. I said, okay, then give me two tacos. He's like, two tacos, coming up. Guy goes to the back, starts preparing the food. I have no clue what's coming out. <laughs> Comes back a few minutes later. He's like, hey, my friend, your tacos are ready. I said, oh, thank you, man. Thank you very much. He's like, yeah, you want a, you want a napkin? So I'm, I'm sorry, what? He said, do you want a napkin? <laughs> and now, L.A., this is where it gets weird for me. <laughs> because you see, where I'm from, napkins are the things babies wear <laughs> to hold their shit. The thing for your mouth we call a serviette. But I didn't know that, so at this point, this manager turned to me offered me food and then said, 
You want a napkin? I said, I'm sorry, I'm confused. What? Why would I want a napkin? So you know, man, for the mess afterwards. I said, for the mess? How instant is it that I need a napkin? I said, hey, man, you never know with tacos, man. One minute you think you got it, the next thing is coming out. I said, that sounds like the most disgusting thing I've ever heard in my life. He's like, no, it's part of the experience. Everybody does it, man. You make a mess, you clean up, you come back and try again, you know? I said, all right, that's an experience I don't want to have. I'm not going to lie. I'm going to skip it. He's like, so you're not going to try my food? I said, okay, I'll try the food, but I'm not going to take the napkin, man. He said, so what are you going to do? I said, well, if it's as crazy as you say it is, I'll just eat the taco in the car on the way home. He's like, oh, you think you're safe. But you're going to be driving. Somebody swerves, you hit their brakes, splat, it's coming out. Don't be a hero, man. Just take the napkin. I said, all right, I'm not being a hero right now. I'm just being a grown-ass man, okay? Like, if it gets really bad, I'll just squeeze super tight till I get to where I'm going. He's like, yeah, that's the problem. Some people, they don't know. They squeeze it too tight, then the juice comes spring out even more. It can spray on your pants and on your shirt. And all. I'm like, on oh, my shirt. How the hell does shit get all the way up to my shirt? What is this, bouncing on the ground and ricocheting back up? What the hell is in this, man? He's like, hey, man, you want the napkin or not? I said, I don't even know what your tacos right now, dude. So much stress. <laughs> now I love tacos. The one president that was always the furthest from being crazy was Nelson Mandela, you know? And I mean, Mandela recently turned 91. I, I just can't help wondering to myself, when you turn 91, wouldn't you throw this huge party? You know, I mean, you're 91 years old. I, would, I don't know, if I turned 91, I'd get wasted. I'd just be that guy, you know? You have all these famous people visiting you. I'd throw this huge party, knocking down the tequilas, having a good time. But I know people never want to think of it. No, Mandela doesn't get drunk. No, people don't want anything. They're like, no, Mandela doesn't fart. His bum just suggests things. He's got that vibe, you know? But I mean, he's still a man at the end of the day, you know? I would have loved for him to just let loose and get totally wasted on his birthday. It would be so crazy seeing my diva pop out like into the garden, you know, out of nowhere, his shirt open, there he is, one of those colorful ones, him walking around, ah, 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 not left me, cross, I left me, left me, I'm fine, ah, ah, I'm fine, ah, ah, I'm, do you know who I am? Do you know, ah, 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 don't touch me. Who are all these people? Who's, who's that? Ah, Bill Clinton. Bill. Come, come here, come here, Bill. Come here, Zappa, Zappa, Bill. Zappa. Thank, thank you for coming, huh? Let, let me tell you a joke, Bill. Let me tell you a joke. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was a good one. Huh? <laughs> I'm just, I'm just saying. Oh, oh, here comes Julius. I was going to talk. Wah, 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 wah. I was also president of the youth league. Wah, 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 wah. Hey, Julius is killing me. Two seconds. Julius, six times five. Okay, it's fine. It will be it's fine. It'll be there for hours. Yeah, let's carry on. Let's carry on. Okay, we're going to drink, all of us, we're going to drink, then. But before we drink, I want to propose a toast. All those people who thought I wouldn't make it to 2010. Yeah, he'll never make it. He'll never make it. I'm still here, 91. 91. Yeah, 91. Even Michael Jackson died before me. <laughs> Even Michael died before me. Yeah. Bodyguards? Yeah, fine. Minister of Finance, it's our money. Bodyguards, bodyguards. Yeah. <laughs> There's some ministers where we're just wasting money now. Huh? Minister of Agriculture. <laughs> Why are you even in a hurry? <laughs> no, you've got the slowest portfolio. Where are you going? <laughs> Nothing happens in agriculture in a hurry. Nothing. There's no drought starting at four. Why are you in a hurry? <laughs> yeah? 
And why do you have bodyguards? Who's trying to kill you? The cabbage mafia. Yeah? No, guys. Just sit in the traffic and shut up. Stop wasting our money. Give Nelson Mandela that motorcade. That's what he needs. Stuck for four hours, people. You know how terrifying that must have been for the ambulance driver? He knows who's in the back. You wouldn't want Nelson Mandela dying on your watch. He's there panicking hour after hour. Nobody coming to help. Finally tried to do something himself. I'm sure he just got up there. He was like, da da, da da, da da. Mandela's there like, ah, ah. Ah, St. Peter, is that you? Just, no, no, Tata, it's me. It's me, it's Piwe. Oh, oh, that's, that's B-E in heaven. Okay? No, Tata, no. We're still here. We're in the ambulance, Tata. The ambulance is stuck. Ah, oh, damn it. Oh, so are they sending another one? Hey, that's the thing, Tata. We've been here for hours. Nothing has happened, eh? So I was thinking maybe, maybe we should hitchhike. <laughs> huh? Ah, man, you are killing me, man. Ah, 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 man. Ah, ah. Tata, what can we do? Ah, okay, okay. Help me up, help me up. Ah. They get up. There they are on the side of the highway. Nelson Mandela and Spiwe trying to get a lift from people. Spiwe is on one side panicking. Mandela's on the other side hitchhiking. <laughs> Nobody's stopping. Spiwe is there. Tata! They're not stopping. They'll never stop for black people. Like, yeah, and those are the black people. Because we don't stop anymore. I wouldn't stop. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't stop. I'd see Nelson Mandela, but I wouldn't stop. No, no, because for the life of me, I would not begin to believe that the man standing on the side of the road hitchhiking is Nelson Mandela. I'd see him, I'd be driving past, I'd be, I'd be like, hey, that guy looks like Nelson Mandela. Look, look, that guy, that guy looks exactly like Nelson Mandela. Yo, it looks like him, it looks like, but I wouldn't stop. Yeah, not because of time. I'd even have time, I'd have time to make a U-turn, in fact. I'd make a U-turn, I'd go back around. You gotta see him, you gotta look at him, he's amazing. He looks exactly like Nelson Mandela. You're gonna see him now, you're gonna see him. We drive past there slowly, look at him. Yo, 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 he looks exactly like Nelson Mandela. And yeah, that guy's even got the face, he's got the hair, he's got, yo, he's even got the shirt, look like Nelson Mandela. I wouldn't stop. I'd even go home and fetch family before I stop. I mean, mom, come, get in, get in. Isaac, come, come, come. Are we going to get a PlayStation? No PlayStation for you. Shut up, get in the car. We're going to fetch Nelson Mandela. Bloody hell, we'll be driving around there. I'll be like, everyone, you must look at me. We're going to slow down. I'm going to slow down. We're going to look at it. We'd slow right down, roll down the windows. Hello? Hello? I'd be like, ah, please, can you even sound like Nelson Mandela? <laughs> but I wouldn't stop. Nobody stops. Culture of distrust. Back in the day, people used to hitchhike in South Africa. Yeah. I remember people used to hitchhike from Durban to Johannesburg. They'd be there on the side of the road. Yeah, people picking them up. Now, nobody. <laughs> nobody stops for anybody. Even Metro Police, you're like, hey! <laughs> nobody stops. I bet even babies couldn't hitch a ride. Be on the side of the road in their diapers then. <laughs> no one would stop. You'd be like, hey, you don't stop for them. You never, ever stop for them. Yeah, you think it's a baby, hey? You think it's a baby, yeah, yeah, they look like babies, and then you stop, and then like a man pops out, hey? Yeah, yeah, happened to my friend Gladys, hey, you don't take chances. We become a culture of distrusting, angry people, that's who we are, everyone's angry. White people have a very different relationship with the police. I was trying to explain this to my friend, Dave. You know, when, we, when we're hanging out, he's like, dude, what is it with black people and police? I'm like, it's not, it's not that black people don't like the police or hate the police, it's just that, it's just that you have a, we have a tumultuous history with the police. One day we were driving. We're driving on the highway, and the police car pulled up behind us. And I got tense, I just got really tense. And he's like, dude, what's going on? I said, the, the police, the police are behind us. And he was like, yeah, and? Did you do anything wrong? I said, that's not the point. <laughs> because it really isn't. For white people, that is the point. The police will send you to jail if you do something wrong. As a black person, you have a different relationship. The police may send you to jail just because. I, I know this because I was, I was driving, I got pulled over by the police for the first time in my life in America. And already I'm, I'm not very comfortable when driving in the United States, you know. Not because of the other side of the road, but because of the other side of the car. I'm not used to that. You know, like I, like I, I, I always get into the car on the wrong side. I'll be shopping and I'll come back to my car confidently and I'll jump inside and put the things down. And then I'm like, ah. <laughs> and then instead of getting out, I sit there. I always just sit there. Because I always think somebody's watching me, so I just sit there and I act like I planned it all. Like, where is my driver? 
Where is my truck? He should have been here by now. Where is my... Oh, well, I guess I'll drive myself. <laughs> I don't know why I do that. But I'm not comfortable. But you have to drive in Los Angeles. So I had a little rental car, and I'm driving on the freeway, and this police car pulls up behind me, and he drives behind me for a little bit, and then he flashes his lights. And I was like, oh, he probably wants to go past. And so I moved over to the middle lane, and then he came with me. And he flashed his lights again. And I was like, oh, come on, just go past me, man. Just go past me. And I went back to the fast lane. He came back with me, and he used the flashlight. And this time he's like, whoop, 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 whoop. And I was like, yeah, go past. You keep doing with me, go past. Because I didn't think he was stopping me. I thought it was basically the vehicular equivalent of that moment on the sidewalk when you both don't know which way to go. I thought we were doing that with our cars. Like, oh, 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 I thought that was happening. I thought that was happening. And clearly he thought that I was evading him in the most polite manner ever. Because he gets irritated and he's like, pull out the side of the road, pull out the side Now I couldn't hear what the hell he was saying. I'm not gonna, which I think is part of the problem. I don't think it's fair that police have speakers on their cars and we don't. I think this is a recipe for disaster. That's the first step in mending relationships is communication, people. I don't know what the hell that guy was saying, but I couldn't tell him. He was like, if I had a speaker, I would have had the ability to be like, sir, I cannot hear what you're saying. Enunciate your words, please. Enunciate your words. Speak clearly. I said, no, no, use your words, buddy. Use your words. Talk to me. Talk to me. What do you need? Pull over. Pull over. I'll be like, okay, I will be pulling over right now. Thank you very much. Like, it would be more effective. But I didn't know. So I'm then, he's like, I'm like, I don't know what the hell you want. To do. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, pull over. Pull over. And I panicked. And so I stopped. I pulled over right there where I was on the freeway, which apparently you're not supposed to do. I didn't know this. I didn't know this because I just know that police tell me to do something, I do it. So he said, pull over. And then I stopped. And then he was like, don't pull over there. Then I was like, well, you should have been more specific. You can't tell me to pull over. And then tell me to not pull over. You should have said pull over at a time that is more appropriate. You can't just tell. Now I'm panicking. He's like, get back into the road. I'm like, this guy does not know what he wants. I'm going back. Now I'm back in the road. And then he's like, take the next exit. And now we're driving. And now he's guiding me along. It's like I had a really angry GPS. It was the weirdest thing ever. And so like, he's driving me like, make a right. Make a right at the lights. Make a right. It's like I chose angry cop on my ways. That's what it felt like. He's like, turn, turn left, no, I said left, turn left, no, recalculating. What is it say, Mickey? What do you love about India? I love many things about India. I, I went for the first time um, this year and it was, it was amazing. You know, what I, you know what I love about India is that it exceeds so many of the expectations that people have put on it unfairly. You know, people like, oh, India, oh, it's really shit and it smells everywhere. And, and it's, it's like, no, no, there are parts of India that are not great. Many parts of India that are beautiful, developing, growing, some of the best food you will ever have in your life, some of the richest history in your nation. India is phenomenal, phenomenal. I will say this, I will say what I didn't love about India, because I wasn't prepared, is that like, I'll warn you, I'll tell you something no one told me before I went to India, and that is, any idea you have of your personal space, <laughs> just let it go. <laughs> just let it go. Doesn't matter what country you're from, like personal, just let it go. Relearn it. Yeah, because India, India truly makes you grapple with, with the idea of, of where do I begin and where does someone end. <laughs> it's a spiritual place. I've never been to a country that is so packed in my entire life. Like, it is packed in India. Like, we throw around a billion and a half people. Oh, they've got a billion. No, they've got a billion and like a billion. Like, they've got a billion and a half people. India is no joke. No joke. And it's everywhere. Everywhere. It's people everywhere. Cars everywhere. You've never seen traffic until you've gone to India. Like, yeah, people are like, oh, the traffic's really bad today. This wasn't traffic. This wasn't traffic, London. This is what had hope. Yo, India's no joke. No joke. You just sit in the car, you don't move, nothing. You're just like there, and then a cow overtakes you. <laughs> She's like, was that a cow? <laughs> Yo, India's on another level. Everybody, everyone beeping. No one moves though. No one moves. I don't even know why the people are beeping. Everyone's just stationary like beep 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 beep
I'll never forget this. We're on the highway. Do you understand what a highway is? You know what a highway is? Yeah. The road where we all drive in the same direction. Someone made a U-turn. <laughs> They made a U-turn and then just dropped. The traffic wasn't really moving. And then they clearly were just like, well, I don't want to do this anymore. And they turned around and they drove against the traffic. We were in the car panicking. We were like, yo, yo, what is he doing? And then the driver, he was like, he's going down the road. <laughs> and we were there like, yeah, stupid ass. I mean, of course he is. So, so sorry. <laughs> India was wild. India was what I go. If you know how to drive in India, you know how to drive it anyway. The cars are coming at you all directions. The lines don't mean anything. Road markings mean nothing. The traffic lights are just a suggestion. I just like re-acclimatize myself with all of this. Like here in London, I'm the only idiot like crossing the street when it's red. Everyone looking at me like, what are you doing? The colors. I'm like, yeah, I was in India. India, those colors mean nothing. It's almost like they saw the lights in other countries and they came back and they're like, we have to build traffic lights. It's like, okay, what are they for? I don't know, but it makes the intersection diverse. Totally interesting. Yo, India was wild. Nandi, let me tell you something. Else. India was what I have never been in a place like India in my entire life. You try, this is how close the cars were. This is how close. Right? The cars. Everybody is playing a game of chicken. Everyone. Everyone. Every car is an inch away from another car. Every single car. An inch away from the other car. An inch away from the other. Like everyone is almost touching. Almost. I didn't realize how close each car was. Until I was on a FaceTime with a friend of mine. He calls me. He's like, yo man, how's India? What's happening? We're chatting, we're chatting. And then he goes, oh well, at least you're making friends. And I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, who's your friend? Who are you talking about? And then you know how on, on, on FaceTime your picture's small? Right? Yes. I blow up my picture. And you see. And then I realized that there was a bus that was so close to us. It was so close to our van that there was a guy in the bus who was just in my face the whole time. <laughs> I've never seen anything like it. Yo, India is rock and roll, people. India is truly rock and roll. All space, personal. Uh, we were at the Taj Mahal. We were at the Taj Mahal. But the Taj Mahal, right? I'll never forget this. We were at the Taj Mahal. And it's one of the most beautiful places. If you ever get a chance, go see it. Is a, it is a wonder of the world. It's, we, we're standing in a line because they have a ton of security in India at public places because of the terrorist attacks that happened years ago, right? Same thing in London and Paris, etc. And so, you, 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 in India, you'll stand in a line divided into men and women. And then what happens is when you get to the end of that line, there's a metal detector. And then on the other side, there's a little podium that you have to stand on. And then there'll be like a man in military fatigues. And they'll wand you down with another metal detector. And then they search you. Very thorough, very thorough. So we're standing in these lines, men, women, standing there lined up. And we're lined up the way you normally line up, right? And then it's my friend, and then it's me, right? And I'm close enough to my friend that like I could whisper to him, he couldn't fall without touching me. Like we are, it's general rules of engagement, right? And so we're moving forward, moving forward, moving forward. We get to the metal detector. In India, you have to stand in it and wait for a moment, and then you step through. He gets into the metal detector, I'm behind him. I turn to say something to our friend who's in the women's line. I turn back, there is now an Indian man <laughs> who is in the gap that I didn't know existed between me and my friend. My brain didn't understand what was going on. I turned and I came, now my friend was Indian, like in a second. You know sometimes the human brain doesn't compute quickly enough, so I came back and I was like, what? And he, this guy wasn't even being a dick, by the way. He didn't like push in, he wasn't mean. It was like clearly a cultural shift. Like I was going, he like took my space. He was like, there was so much space. <laughs> clearly this guy didn't want to be in it. And he just slid in there and he stood. And, and it was, he was just there. It was just there. I was so shocked at his magical appearance that I gasped. Like I, I, I literally, I audibly gasped. I stand there and he got in and I was like, oh! And I think in that gasp, I created more space because two other Indian men <laughs> slotted in between us. Yo, London, I have never seen anything like this in my life. Like, in the space of one, there were four. Like, literally, all of us, all touching, we're like connected as human beings. Like, our breathing was synced. I could feel all of our heartbeats at the same time. Like,
never been that close to other men in my entire life. Ever. <laughs> ever, 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 ever. If I was in Uganda, I would have been arrested. Let me tell you something. <laughs> 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 Like, I could see why they didn't have a line for women. If there was a woman in that line with me, she would have been pregnant. There's nothing we could have done. It's like it would just be. You just get to the other side and be like, all right, what do we name it? Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. And it was wild. So you're in the line. So now I don't want to get left behind again. I don't want more people. I don't want to lose my space. So my friend goes through. I'm waiting for each Indian guy to go through. Now I'm uptight. I'm uptight. I'm like, I'm not losing anything. I'm like holding on. I'm holding on. I'm holding on. I get into the metal detector, get out on the other side. And you climb up on these, on these little stairs onto the podium, and then the guy, the guy wants me down, and then he starts searching. And when I say searching, I mean searching. <laughs> Not this like play play thing that our security does on this side of the world. You know, like here when they pat you down, they just like they just do that. Like this, you know? It's like that. It's just, no. In India, when they search you, they squeeze. <laughs> Every part of your body, they squeeze it, squeeze it. That starts at your shoes, pressing down. I'm like, what kind of gun could fit above my toes? Squeeze it, it comes up, squeeze the ankle, started coming up, I can't squeeze it, squeeze every inch of me. I was like, if I have a gun or cancer, this man will find it. Squeeze, squeeze, squeeze all the way. And then, I was fine, I was fine, until he got above my knee. <laughs> and it was like, I was like, okay, now it's a little, do you know what I mean? Because like, was, was like, everything below the knee is, is business. And then above the knee, I mean, start catching feelings. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, because like, he was like squeezing, and he starts coming up my leg, and I'm a little ticklish, and I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. Like, he's sque and he's squeezing me like, even like a close lover has been squeezing me. <laughs> Yo, what's going on with you, man? What's happening? I was like, no, it's not, it's not what you think. It's not what you think. <laughs> what, like, what are you doing? I thought you were going to touch my heart. I was like, I am going to touch my heart. Are you doing this without me, Trevor? I was like, I'm sure you're going. I'm sure you're going. I'm coming out. Like, you don't come out now. Don't come out now. Don't come out now. This has nothing to do with you. Don't come out now. I promise you, it's not what you think. I'm like, okay, but I feel like it's happening. Stop happening. It's not happening. Squeezing my leg, he's coming up my leg, always squeezing, squeezing, and then he comes up my, like up my thigh, and then at some point his hand is in this crack here, like in this, you know what I'm saying, like deep in there, he's like up there, and he's cradling, like cradling all of it, holding me tight, tight, and you know like the gap, like just before the business begins, you know what I mean? And he's in there, and he's holding my leg, and I'll never forget this moment, never till I die. Holding my leg and he looks up at me. <laughs> and he looks up at me from a position where he should have no power. <laughs> he should have none whatsoever. And yet somehow he's managed to maintain all of it. And he looks up at me and he's like, Where from? <laughs> I said, What? And he's like, Where from? I was like, I, I think it's from my father technically. <laughs> Is that how genetics work? I don't know. I, I think it's... Like, what? No. You. Where from? You. Where from? I was like, oh, where am I from? Um, South Africa. Okay. And then he moved to the other leg. And squeezed it all the way down. Let me tell you something, London. I have thought about that man <laughs> almost every night since then. <laughs> the way he touched me, the way he talked to me, the question, like, why that question? Why then? I don't like it. I was like, was there a wrong answer? Like, was South Africa the only reason I come? Like, I keep thinking, I'm like, was, was I this close? Like, I always imagine him just like coming up my leg and getting and he's like, where from? Where from? And like, I mean, if I was like, Pakistan, he'd be like, Come ah! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you guys are so much fun to me.
say we have no clue. There could be some guy every single day at the Khao train with a bomb. ISIS has sent him on a mission to blow us up. We've never heard about it because he's never succeeded. Every day the guy's there leaving his backpack, running out of the station, tries to blow it up. Where is the backpack? Where is the backpack? What happened? Have you, have you, where is the backpack? Goes back home, spends a few weeks building another bomb, puts it in his backpack, gets back to the Khao train station, puts the bag there, runs out. Turns around, there's nothing there. I don't understand. I heard an explosion. What, what happened? Excuse me. What happened? What, what do you mean what happened? I heard the explosion, but there, there, there was, it's not here. No, no, no. Somebody was with the ATM. <laughs> they were bombing an ATM. Yes, but where is, where is my backpack? I don't, I don't know. Where did you leave it? It was here. Yeah, no, no, my man. Sorry. Eh? Maybe you can go to the police station. I'm going to go. I'm going to go to the police station. This poor guy is losing his mind. He's never experienced this before. He's never had his bomb stolen. <laughs> He's in South Africa. Things have changed. There he is, walking into the police station at night. Police sitting around. There's a constable writing statements, dealing with his last customer. Yeah, so you say, my man, drunk drive. You can't just drunk drive here, eh? You can't just drunk drive here, okay? Do you hear me? Oh, bro, I got you. I got you. <laughs> Uh, can you just, can I go? You can't go anywhere, my man. You must phone someone to come and fetch you. You're drunk, man. Just sit here. I'm not finished with you, okay? I'm not finished. You're okay, okay, bro. Do you need water? No, I'm fine. I'm fine. Hey, no, no, just, just drink some water there. Drink some, don't do your things here. Next. Come, Baba, next. You're next. Hello, hello. Good, good evening. How are you, sir? I'm good, sir. How are you? I'm, I'm, I'm not doing good. I would like to report a crime, please. Okay, reporting a crime. What happened, sir? Uh, my, my backpack, it was stolen. Your backpack was stolen? Yes, that is correct. Okay, the, so you want to report the stolen backpack, yes? Yes, that is correct. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, Cynthia, you guy for me stolen goods. <laughs> come on, guy. Okay, come on, okay. Yeah, pink, you know? Pink form. Okay, so, uh, stolen goods. Uh, just one question, do you have insurance? No, no I, I, don't, I don't have insurance. Yeah, first mistake, that one. <laughs> You know, I love how, how police do that in South Africa. They ask you, do you have insurance? And they almost ask it like they're saying, do you have insurance? Like they're going to be like, so what I'm saying is, must I look or... Or do you want a new one? I'm just asking. Insurance is going to, or must I, must I look for it for you? No, I, I don't have insurance. Okay, no insurance. Okay. The, the goods that were stolen, it's your personal goods or it's company items? I mean, technically it's for company, but I, I mean, it's for me. I guess it's for company. Okay, company name? Uh, I, ISIS. Abosis. Okay. Stolen goods. Okay, can you tell me what happened? Yes, what, what, what happened was I, I, I hit my, my, my backpack and I, I put it down in, in, in the, the station and then when I came back, the backpack, it, it was gone. Okay, backpack. Please tell yeah, my man, you can't do that here. Yeah. <laughs> so you just left your bag and you walked away? Yes, that, that is what I did. No, 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 no. You see, my friend, there's the first crime here. A crime of stupidity. <laughs> You can't just do that here. Yo, bro, you can't do that in this country. Eh? Yes, luck. Can't leave anything lying around. Criminals everywhere, eh? Yeah, says the drunk driver. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, okay, the big pig stolen. So you want the big pig back? No, no, well, to be honest, I just want to know what is happening. I've never experienced this. Okay. You, no, you see, my friend, you can't just leave a backpack lying around. Eh? This is South Africa. On your country, can you just leave a backpack lying around? Where are you from? I'm from Syria. So can you just leave your backpack any place? Well, to be honest, there is no place left. Oh. Okay. Yeah, no, no, here it's different, eh? Okay, so can you just tell me what are the contents on that backpack? The things inside the backpack? Yes, what is inside? Oh, 
not just some random things. Yeah, so I must look for random things now. <laughs> eh? Who, who am I? Who am I? Eh? Am I the pink panther? <laughs> eh? I'm just going around random, random. Is this your keys? Eh? Is this your underwears? Eh? Is this normal, man? You can't just say random. What's inside that backpack? I have, uh, there is, there is, uh, there is a, 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 time, a timer. Okay, timer. Like an old man or a clock? <laughs> no, like a clock. Okay, one clock. Anything else? Yes, there is also some wires. Okay, wires, with especially what kind? No, many different colors. Red, blue, yellow. Okay, multicolor wires. Anything else? Yes, there is also some nitroglycerin. Okay, nitro... 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 Glycerin, nitro, glycerin. I'm just gonna put Vaseline here. Yeah. <laughs> I get that one, I get that man, all of them. So it's the same thing. Cynthia, Vaseline, glycerin, that one, eh? Yeah, okay, Vaseline here. Yeah. Okay, what else on the backpack? There is also a, a, a detonator. There is a detonator in. Detonator? A detonator, a detonator, the wires, a bomb! <laughs> you had a bomb on that back? Yes, I have a bomb. A bomb! Yes, I have a bomb. So why you don't just say bomb? <laughs> now you're making me write an essay here. Look now, I'm finishing that paper. This is writing, writing, hey, hey, wire, wire. Now, now I'm scratching here and Chris, Chris, Rin, what, what? Making me look like Bonang, I don't even know what I'm writing here. <laughs> ah, man, ah, ah. I don't have time for this shenanigans, man. Just say it's a bomb, okay? Come on, man. We're getting to business, yeah. Yo, bro, business, eh? That's what, yeah, when I shut up, when up. And, and also, when are your friends coming? Yo, yeah, bro, I can't find them. I don't have a phone. Eh? Cynthia, you can phone your house. Come on, come on, begging. Yeah, what's the phone? Yeah, yeah, phone your friends. Tell them they must come and fetch you. Oh, thanks, bro. What's the code there? Cynthia, code your house. Oh, 10 triple one. 10 triple one. <laughs> Oh, thanks, uh, bro. Hold on, hold on. Uh, hey, Josh, bro. Oh, bro, I need your help, eh? Yo, I'm here at the police station, bro. Oh, they're holding me here. Hey, we're not holding you. I'm not your girlfriend. <laughs> Tell them you're arrested. Yo, bro, they, they arrested me, bro. Yo, Yo dude, for like nothing. Eh? Eh, nothing. A drunk. Tell them, Josh, is I'm a drunk driver. <laughs> not nothing here. Tell them, Josh, I'm a drunk driver. Tell him, tell him what you did here. Yeah. Yo, bro, stop shouting, eh? Come on. Yo, Josh, bro, yo, can you just come, please, bro? Just come, just come and get. Yo, they're gonna let me go, bro. I'm just like, we'll give them like 200 rand or something, bro. Yeah? What, we'll just give us two. You, what did you say? Bro, I said I'll give you 200. 200? Are you trying to bribe me? Are you trying to bribe me? Eh? Bribery, it's a crime. A crime. So now, drunk driving and bribery. So now it's 500. <laughs> bro, you can't just raise the price like that. No, no, no. Don't tell me what I can and cannot do. Oh, jeez, man. You guys are so corrupt. Uh, you're so bloody corrupt. I'm corrupt. I'm corrupt by myself, ne? Who, who am I corrupt with by myself? Eh? Am I taking the money, putting the money on my own pocket? Eh? Pocket to pocket. Who's bribing me? Eh? Oh, please. Don't come here with yourself, righteous. Please. Oh, oh, you're corrupt. You're corrupt. Don't play games. We're on the same pot, my friend. Eh? Your water is your water. My stew is your stew. Taste that. Mwah, same thing. You're bribing me, but I'm corrupt. Even you. Even you. When, uh, this, you know these people. Do you have white people there in Syria? No, we don't, we don't really have them. Yeah, you are lucky. Eh? You are so lucky. Hey, these ones. Oh, bro, that's racist. You can't say that. What do you mean is racist? Racist why? Racist why? You can't say he's lucky not to have white people. Eh? Don't be like that, bro. Come on, eh? Come, come, don't do the air when I was on jail when I shut up when you are even you, man. You shut up, you lapo shapa, shapa hamba when you fuck a lapo hamba gina when yeah, you must practice, vele. Must practice your Zulu, yes, yes. This guy is coming, you know, this guy's every week drunk driving, same people every week. Okay, so we can just check here, my friend. We've got a bag, we've reported it, I've got the case number. Uh, you give me a phone number, I can phone you, okay? I can let you know if something, if, we get, if it comes up. Uh, you don't want to phone the phone number? No, I want to phone your phone number, I'm telling you. No, you don't want to phone my phone number, I'm telling you. No, I'm telling you. I'm phoning. 
you can't phone, if you phone my phone number, something very bad can happen. What does that mean? It means something, the worst that can happen on a call. Oh, you've got CLC. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll send you an SMS then if I find it. Just take this case number and listen, my friend. On this country, you can't just leave things lying around, yeah? Can't just leave things lying around. If something is valuable, you must keep it on your person, okay? Are you saying what I think you are saying? Yes. If it's valuable to you, you must keep it on your person. But you understand this is going to kill me. Even me, it kills me every day. <laughs> I must carry my tablet, my phone, my keys, my remote, everything on me. This is South Africa, must be vigilant here, yeah. okay? Must be safe. Yo, bro, you gotta be safe out here. Yeah. You gotta be super safe. Yeah, listen to my friend here. Yeah. You must be safe. Okay, you, you, you're good. Oh, okay, my friend, I'm going to do what you said. Goodbye. The guy leaves for two weeks. He goes and makes himself a suicide vest, taking the advice of the policeman. And then the big day comes. He's gonna end it all. He walks back to the Hau train station. As he turns the corner, he sees his goal. As he steps into the road, he's about to follow through and then three guys jump out of nowhere and they're like, yeah, foot sick, bring that jacket, bring that jacket. Hey, bring that jacket. What are you doing? We're robbing you, you stupid, bring that jacket. Bring that jacket. No, no, you can't take this, this is bomb jacket. Yeah, we want a bomber jacket, bring that jacket. Bring that jacket, yeah, foot sick, foot sick. Come track. Check. It is pretty interesting how people tend to judge things. People tend to say things differently based on the area. And not just based on the area, based on where they grew up and their uh, countries of origin. You know, talking about uh, talking about the South African police, one thing I've noticed with African police, especially South African police, is they are very, very chill. You know, <clears throat> they take things differently. And what, what, what really makes them chill sometimes is the way people talk, you know. Um, the way people talk, the way they talk makes them very, very chill. And also makes it in such a way that you, the person that has been uh, stopped or apprehended, you you don't tend to feel, um, uh, how can I put it? You, you, you don't tend to feel scared of the person that is, uh, you don't tend to feel scared of the person that is, um, how can I put it, that is apprehending you, you know? And is it okay for cops to act that way? No, it is not okay for cops to act that way. Right? It's always nice for cops to be, uh, it's always nice for cops to be tough because if cops just uh, be chill all the time, we might not take them serious, you might not take them serious. So it's very, very, um, So it's very, very important for officers to be officers to be tough because once they are tough, then you will take them seriously. And it's funny how the officer never knew what the girl was about. It's funny how the officer never knew what the guy was uh, was about, what his motives were, and and uh, what he was trying to do, you know. And I get it, you know. Um, it's always nice for officers to be pretty, pretty vigilant and be. Tough when it comes to people, you know, especially people that, um, especially people that have negative um, or bad intentions about the country, about the land, 
and <clears throat> and also being very very smart is is another thing too that is good to take into consideration because as an officer if you're not smart you might people might do crazy things that <clears throat> it will fall upon you and you have to answer to your boss for it and your boss will like why didn't you catch that way ahead of time you know why didn't you do the why didn't you do that so it's always good to be very very smart don't let um don't let people with bad or negative intentions <clears throat> influence influence you and uh, make you do things that you will have to report to your boss or regret later doing it so it's always good to not allow your intentions ruin the course of your day you know if you apprehend somebody and suspicions call the person in question right away you know save lives and save a lot of um, <clears throat> a lot of things that um, a lot of things that might happen afterwards so it's good to be cautious and and also be smart knowing fully fully well knowing fully fully well that knowing fully fully well that people um have bad intentions so you shouldn't just let people do whatever they want to do or let them slide you know always see people based on the possibilities and the things that based on the possibilities and the things that that they can do you know and is good in life is not judge a book by its cover you know because you might end up being uh, I may end up being racist. I don't wanna. And you don't wanna be that person, you know. You don't wanna be such a person ever. So it's always good to know how you apprehend, know how you treat people and make sure that you Make sure that you do things with with, uh, with care and cautious. It is very very important. I like the way Chevanova tells you a joke in such a way that it puts you. You tend to put yourself in the joke and see yourself being 
being part of the joke it makes it very 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 nice it's something that i wish i had such a talent like that it would be really really astonishingly great to have such a talent or skill like that anyway thank you guys i hope you guys enjoyed the video and and Sarah, to the south african police you should be very very vigilant and uh, smart when it comes to apprehending people you know don't trust people thank you